Chapter Nine of Abraham Lincoln: A History, Volume Four. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. Abraham Lincoln: A History, Volume Four, by John Hay and John George Nicolay. Chapter Nine, Texas. When secession began, there were in the great state of Texas a total of 2,445 United States soldiers. Their duty was to guard a frontier line of more than a thousand miles, partly along the border of Mexico, partly along the boundary of the Indian Territory. These troops were stationed in small detachments at 18 different posts, widely scattered and difficult of access, the nearest being 60 and the farthest 600 miles distant from San Antonio, the department headquarters. Brigadier General David E. Twiggs, Major General by Brevet, had returned to the Department of Texas and resumed command on November 27, 1860, reaching San Antonio December 8. Perhaps he was sent back by that subtle influence then in power at Washington, which placed so many officers of Southern birth and proclivities in stations of trust, where they might, as was no doubt hoped in certain contingencies they would, render passive or active help to the contemplated insurrection. Twiggs soon gave evidence of his sympathy with the rebels. A two years' residence in New Orleans had probably imbued him with secession notions and purposes. Nevertheless, his convictions of soldierly duty and sense of military honor seemed to have tempered his utterances and restrained his actions. About two weeks after he had assumed command by general orders, he wrote from headquarters at San Antonio to General Scott, predicting the secession of Texas, and asking instructions. The reply which the General-in-Chief felt compelled to send is another strong indictment of President Buchanan for that want of patriotic vigilance and neglect of executive duty which everywhere permitted feeble rivulets of disloyalty to grow unchecked into active streams of treason and finally to unite in a torrent of rebellion. In cases of political disturbance involving local conflict with the authority of the general government, the General-in-Chief considers that the military questions, such as you suggest, contain a political element, with due regard to which, and in due deference to the chief executive authority, no extraordinary instructions concerning them must be issued without the consent of such authority. He has labored hard in suggesting and urging proper measures to vindicate the laws and protect the property of the United States, without waging war or acting offensively against any state or community. All such suggestions, though long since made in good time to have been peaceably and efficiently carried out, have failed to secure the favorable attention of the government. Scott concluded by commending affairs to your discretion, firmness, and patriotism, but these proved a poor reliance. Still, Twiggs did not rush eagerly into treason. Four times after this he called attention to the coming danger. He declared that he was a southern man, that all he had was in the south that he must follow Georgia out of the Union, and ask to be relieved of his command before the 4th of March. Had he been patriotic instead of disloyal, or had President Buchanan sent a faithful and energetic officer to replace him, the current of events might have been greatly modified. The political elements of Texas were somewhat antagonistic. In pro-slavery sentiment, in a spirit of adventure peculiar to frontier states, and in the extensive organization of secret societies, known as Knights of the Golden Circle, secession found, as elsewhere, a favoring influence. On the other hand, the sparseness of population, the large infusion of German emigrants, and especially the determined opposition of the governor were serious impediments to disunion and revolt. General Sam Houston, famous as the liberator of Texas, was governor. Though pro-slavery in sentiment, he had no sympathy with the southern elecues which now plotted the destruction of the great government to which he had linked the fortune of the Lone Star State. A sagacious and resolute leader in former revolutions, this new crisis paralyzed him with a divided purpose and a misguided ambition. Opposing secession, he either dared not nor desired not to defend the Union, but shaped his plans to bring about an independent local revolution, which should erect Texas into a separate nation to be enlarged and strengthened by the subsequent conquest and annexation of Mexico. Replying to the invitation of the Alabama commissioner to join a Southern Confederacy, he rebuked the theory and principle of secession, and said that the people of Texas 
will prefer a separate nationality to even an equal position in a confederacy which may be broken and destroyed at any moment by the caprice or dissatisfaction of one of its members texas has views of expansion not common to many of her sister states although an empire within herself she feels that there is an empire beyond essential to her security she will not be content to have the path of her destiny clogged the same spirit of enterprise which founded a republic here will carry her institutions southward and westward under favoring conditions this bold and daring conception might perhaps have been a dazzling lure for the restive elements of southern communities which had hitherto spent their force in filibustering enterprises offering proportionately fewer rewards and encountering vastly greater hazards but a little reflection ought to have shown him that this southern and western empire was precisely the object at which the confederate conspiracy was grasping and that in attempting to interpose between it and the power of the union he like the border states was placing himself in the path of certain destruction the governor's intrigue being passive and secession active and audaciously aggressive he gradually but steadily lost ground at first he refused to call together the texas legislature but the conspirators set on foot a revolutionary state convention under an entirely illegal and irresponsible call self-constituted committees appointed time and place for an election at which polls were opened on request of any five citizens such an election was of course utterly without authority underwent no scrutiny and imposed no obligation either on candidates or on voters present or absent nearly half the counties in the state were unrepresented and those which acted in many cases sent delegates upon insignificant and farcical minority votes houston was at length constrained to convene the legislature in extra session and in a message while declaring that the election of lincoln was no cause for secession and that there could be no middle ground between constitutional remedies and anarchy nevertheless proposed that the people should express their will at the ballot box and that he would not oppose a convention the legislature had however so far slipped from his grasp as to pass a joint resolution that the government of the state of texas hereby gives its assent to and approves the convention which had been so irregularly and illegally called houston probably seeing no other way out of his dilemma formally approved this resolution with a protest against the assumption of any powers on the part of said convention beyond the reference to the question of a longer connection of texas with the union to the people the convention which had meanwhile assembled did not even wait for the governor's approval on the first of february it passed an ordinance of secession appointing the twenty-third of that month for its submission to popular vote in the state as in virginia this was the merest pretense of an appeal to the people with perfect predetermination the convention proceeded to appoint delegates to the montgomery congress and took secret steps to effect a revolutionary seizure of military control the warnings and requests of general twiggs had at length stirred the washington authorities to action by orders of january twenty eighth twiggs was relieved and colonel c a waite placed in command of the department of texas five companies of artillery stationed along the rio grande were three days afterwards ordered to be withdrawn by sea and were sent some to fort jefferson at tortugas and fort taylor at key west and others ordered north to aid in the defense of washington as the political condition of texas was daily growing more alarming general scott issued the following sweeping order to the new commander on february fifteenth in the event of the secession of the state of texas the general-in-chief directs that you will without unnecessary delay put in march for fort leavenworth kansas the entire military force of your department preliminary thereto you will at once concentrate the troops in sufficient bodies to protect their march out of the country at central points on the proper lines of march this order came fully two weeks too late the convention had sent three commissioners to treat with general twiggs for the surrender and evacuation of the military posts he was already favorably disposed toward such an agreement and on february ninth appointed a military commission to transact such business as relates to the disposition of the public property upon the demand of the state of texas negotiations were duly proceeding between these bodies when the change of command became known and the texas commissioners resolved on bolder measures on the morning of february sixteenth before daylight the noted partisan leader ben mcculloch appeared before the town of san antonio 
with some twelve to fifteen hundred hastily gathered rebel volunteers and entered and took possession of the arsenal and the public storehouses backed by this force the commissioners at six o'clock in the morning sent twiggs a peremptory demand that he should deliver up all military posts and public property he was in no mood to refuse and his two companies of regulars could have offered no successful resistance so the official transfer was formally made colonel waite the new commander was yet sixty miles distant at camp verde and did not reach san antonio till february nineteenth when he arrived he found that general twiggs had further agreed to withdraw the army by way of the coast and had issued his orders for the movement colonel waite's report says the troops in this department are stationed at different camps or posts in small garrisons and spread over a very large extent of country to concentrate a sufficient number to make a successful resistance after the texans had taken the field was not practicable besides we had no large depot of provisions to move upon and the means of transportation at the post were so limited that the troops could have taken with them a supply for only a few days an attempt to bring them together would have no doubt resulted in their being cut up in detail before they could get out of the country under these circumstances i felt it my duty to comply with the agreement entered into by general twiggs and remove the troops from the country as early as possible the election at which the secession ordinance was submitted was duly held february twenty third and the reported vote showed a large majority in its favor the result was announced in convention march fourth and texas declared to be free and independent on the following day march fifth the convention ratified the constitution of the provisional government of the confederate states and instructed its delegates appointed prior to the popular vote on the secession ordinance to apply for the admission of texas so much being done it supposed its task to be finished and sent a committee to governor houston to invite his adhesion but this the governor still stubbornly refused replying march sixth that the convention was empowered only to submit the question of secession to the vote of the people the convention performed the functions assigned to it by the legislature and in the opinion of the executive its powers were then exhausted he added that it would be within the province of the legislature to call a new convention with authority to make such changes in the constitution of the state as her present and future relations to the world at large may require this position the governor also further maintained in an answer which he instructed his secretary of state to write march thirteenth to the confederate secretary of war who had at once claimed control of military operations the governor in firm language repudiated such control representing on behalf of the people of texas the course pursued in annexing them to a new government without their knowledge or consent bold words were however of little avail against bolder deeds of usurpation the convention disdaining any other authority than that afforded by the ragged regiment of ben mcculloch declined to be set aside it passed an ordinance requiring state officers to appear in open convention at a designated hour to take an oath of allegiance to the confederate states houston being notified responded that he did not recognize the convention at the appointed hour the name of governor sam houston was called but as he did not appear the lieutenant governor came forward and took the prescribed oath another ordinance was at once adopted that the office of governor of the state of texas by reason of the refusal of the late governor sam houston to take the official oath is vacant and that the lieutenant governor edward clark is hereby required and authorized to exercise the powers and authority etc against the action of the convention governor houston had nothing to oppose except an address to the people which he published on the same day he recited his many services and reiterated his continued devotion to the lone star state he denounced the convention as revolutionary and without the sanction of a majority of the people he declared it would be impossible to enumerate all its usurpations as a great part of its proceedings had been in secret that while a portion of its appointed delegates were representing texas in the confederate congress two of them still claiming to be united states senators continued to represent texas in the united states senate the people he said had been transferred like sheep from the shambles required to support a constitution which ignored their very name and render allegiance to a government to which texas had never been annexed he protested against the act of the convention whose members were bound by no oath themselves and who nevertheless declared his office vacant because he refused the oath they prescribed for him 
if he had adhered patriotically to the union he might perhaps yet have found means to resist this usurpation of his official functions two weeks later april first there arrived at the headquarters of colonel waite a messenger from washington bearing important dispatches from the lincoln administration they contained the order of general scott directing colonel waite if he still had sufficient troops within call to form immediately a strongly entrenched camp at some suitable point convenient to and covering the post and seaport of indianola of not less than five hundred but preferably of twelve hundred men and hold the same against hostile texans until further orders the objects of the entrenched camp near indianola continued general scott's letter are first to keep a foothold in that state till the question of secession on her part be definitely settled among her own people and second in case of conflict between them to give such aid and support to general houston or other head of authority in the defense of the federal government as may be within your power the substance of this proffer of help was also communicated to governor houston by another special messenger who went directly to austin but either the governor had lost his courage or was unwilling to compromise his scheme of texan independence he wrote to colonel waite declining the assistance of the united states government and protesting against the concentration of troops or fortifications in texas this refusal is the end of houston's public career without aid he could no longer command sufficient popular support to maintain his authority against the local revolution he was nearly seventy years old and his advanced age was perhaps the underlying cause of his inability to ride and direct the new political storm the orders from general scott to tender aid to governor houston also instructed colonel waite that if there were no substantial union party under the lead of houston or some other executive authority of texas ready to defend the federal authority by force of arms he might consider as withdrawn the suggestion of forming an entrenched camp and might proceed with the evacuation of the state colonel waite therefore devoted his attention to this latter duty and as rapidly as possible brought his different detachments from their stations towards indianola to embark for the north in the very nature of things this could only go on very slowly twigg's capitulation had provided that all troops should retain their arms and the artillery companies their guns but the quartermaster's property being turned over to the commissioners they had the control of all means of transportation and these they were in no haste to place at the service of the commanding officer at the moment they had no great love for the united states army much as had been yielded to the conspirators they desired and expected a great deal more because a few officers were ready to desert their flag and forfeit their honor they assumed that the whole army in texas would go over to the service of the rebellion would prefer your going to texas and securing the united states troops for our army telegraphed the rebel secretary of war to colonel earl van dorn who after conferring with two officers whose allegiance was as frail as his own wrote back i think i shall have no difficulty in securing many of the troops and officers the result did not confirm his sanguine expectations excepting general twiggs and half a dozen others of insignificant rank and influence officers and soldiers remained true to their flag notwithstanding the fact as reported by the commander that the most flattering inducements were held out by agents of the confederate states for them to resign and enter that service the lapse of a few weeks brought matters to a crisis sumter had no sooner fallen than dispatches went from montgomery to van dorn directing him to arrest and seize all troops and stores of the united states in transitu or otherwise wherever found in the state of texas before this order could be executed the greater part of the troops had sailed only about seven hundred remained in the state one detachment of these was at indianola ready to embark but being delayed by the non-arrival of the transport and the prevalence of bad weather the commanding officer made praiseworthy efforts to take them to a mexican port in schooners before they could put to sea however van dorn appeared with three steamers containing triple their number of texans and compelled their surrender afterwards allowing them to proceed northward on parole about the same time colonel waite and his headquarters staff at san antonio were made prisoners the last detachment pursuing its march to the coast was similarly confronted by overwhelming numbers at san lucas springs brought to surrender and held as close prisoners of war thus before the middle of may the whole of texas was firmly in the military grasp of jefferson davis long before the happening of the later events here narrated president buchanan being yet in authority when information reached washington dismissed general twiggs from the army of the united states for his treachery to the flag of his country End of chapter nine